It's funny. I, yeah. All right. It's being recorded. Okay. Thanks. So, do you want to put Sean onto the panel? Sure, Sean. I'm going to promote you to panelist, and then we can. Okay. Hi, Sean. For Hi, people, Sean. Who, for people who don't know, Sean is the finance director for the town. And I'm very pleased that he agreed to participate. Sean, at the moment, we're one short of a, uh, a quorum. Um, but I'm expecting other people to join us. And in the interest of kind of getting going, I uh, really would appreciate if you're ready to begin talking. And then we can all ask questions once you have started with your initial presentation. I am. Um, I was going to see if maybe we could bring Dave Z in here too. I just want to make sure. Um, I have no problem going for it. I just don't want to, because you don't have quorum, I don't want to do anything that causes any issues for anybody. So um, Dave might have more experience to know if there's any issue with me going forward with the presentation before you have quorum. Well, luckily, uh, Will just joined us, Sean. So I think we, uh, okay. we, got we just made it. Problem solved. Keep leaving the audience. We don't need them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We'll need them later. Um, all right, do, do you want me to like, are you going to call your meeting to order before I start? Uh, I think I just did, but I don't usually do that formally. Okay. But thanks, Sean. All right. So should I just go ahead? Yes, please do. All right. So um, do I have the right to share screen? Okay, I do. So I'm gonna share my screen. All right, you should all see hopefully the Engage Amherst webpage on the screen. Do you see that? Uh, yep. Okay. So we set up a um, we set up an Engage Amherst page, which is a, a project page on our, our town website. Um, and you can get to it, engageamherst.org. Uh, I think it's forward slash ARPA. And so this page is dedicated to ARPA. It gives a little bit of a tutorial or introduction to what ARPA is. And it gives a timeline, which over here on the right, um, you'll see that we did our initial presentation of our draft spending plan to council. We are now in a public engagement mode, which this uh, session tonight is part of. Um, we've held two listening sessions so far. We did that yesterday. Um, they were lightly attended, but we did get uh, some feedback. And then we have another one um, next week or the 21st. I think that's next week. Um, or we have two more next week to, um, to get more feedback. Um, so if anybody's listening and wants to submit feedback through one of those listening sessions, you certainly can do so. Also on this Q&A or also on this web page is a Q&A feature where you can um, ask a question about ARPA through this, this little tool in the middle. Um, or you can even just provide feedback. A lot of people have been using it just to um, submit feedback on the plan of what they like, what they don't like. Um, and then all the feedback gets cataloged down below, which is nice. Breaking up. Okay, now you're you're okay. good now again. Okay, if I break up again, let me know. I'll move to a, I'm in the farthest part of my house um, away, from, <laughs> away from my kids who might distract me. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I can move closer to the, uh, the Wi-Fi router if I need to. So um, also in here is the uh, presentation to the council. Um, and so I'm just gonna go to the sections that relate to housing. So the, um, the first section that relates to housing is um, homelessness. And we earmarked a million dollars for this. Um, I would say the two, the two areas that focus housing, hom homelessness, and then the affordable housing slide that's coming up next um, there are two of the areas where we have released details about what we want to do. Um, I know you uh, the trust <laughs> did a lot of good ideas. And so the way we've set this up is we've earmarked funds for these initiatives, but we've sort of identified that we need to do more collaboration and more planning um, with you all and with staff and with others um, to develop the programs before we can be more specific about what programs we want to move forward with. Um, so in the homelessness area, we know we want to we earmarked a million and we know we want to explore transitional housing opportunities and to identify and implement um, solutions to some of our shelter problems that we have on an annual basis. 
Okay, Sean. Sure. Like, yep. like, it's okay if I could stop for a minute. Yeah, yeah, stop. Um, I understand that the town already bought an accessible shower for so, a trailer that has an accessible shower. Shower. Am I incorrect about that? Um, you're a little off. So we bought a trailer that did not have an accessible shower. Um, and we are looking at ways to either trade that, that one in for one that has an accessible shower or just um, return it. And the other thing we are doing is we are looking to make modifications to, a, um, to another facility to put in an accessible shower. Um, and we have a bid solicitation that I think might have closed today or, or closes tomorrow um, for basically to get proposals from contractors to modify a space to put an accessible shower in. Um, and great. That have to be done in the next few weeks. Thanks. Yeah. So and again, so these um, these prior proposals that um, are on this page on the right, they're based on the feedback. I think some of this came from the Housing Trust um, and from others like Craig's Doors and um, the Survival Center and other uh, stakeholders um, on the left. These were the impacts and issues that were identified. And then these were the on the right side of the, the proposed spending allocations. So the next one is um, a separate $1 million uh, specifically on the affordable housing side. And that's to look for opportunities to expand uh, the affordable housing stock and then to work collaboratively with the housing trust on housing assistance programs. Um, we wanted this to sort of capture a lot of what, um, a lot of the ideas that you all uh, sent over. Um, but again, acknowledging that some of those ideas require a lot more thought and a lot more um, planning to see if we could possibly implement them. Um, and again, the feedback that this is based on is on the left. And then there's a couple other areas that sort of relate that I'll just go to quickly. Um, I know one of the, one of the um, proposals from the Housing Trust was around um, modifying um, apartment units to make them more efficient. Um, so we, so there is funding in here for sustainability. I don't know if the, that type of program potentially could come out of this, this batch of funds. This is um, the proposal here is for the environmental action or environmental um, climate action committee and the sustainability coordinator and others to work together to figure out how to use these funds to make the biggest impact on carbon reduction. Um, so it's possible a program like that could be um, funded from this area, but they're going to have to do more work to see if that's if that's how they they want to allocate these funds. Um, all of these at this point are our draft form, so that's why we're here tonight to get your feedback on it. Um, and then in November, I, oh sorry, go ahead. Can I, I? I was just so this is this money like in the purview of whoever you just said it was. I mean, so these do these different things actually pertain to different uh, entities that are going to figure this out? Or could anybody put in a, su a suggestion for this thing? So anybody right now, I, and, I, and I encourage you to, if you have ideas, to submit them. So now's the time. If you have specific programs or ideas that you want the town to consider, get them in now. Um, ultimately, the town manager has to finalize a spending plan in November, and we have to go back to the council and present a final spending plan. Um, and so these funds would be, they'd be town funds that would be at the direction of the town manager. And I'm sure um, the assistant town manager and the, the uh, sustainability coordinator would guide them, um, but they would work with other stakeholders to determine the best way uh, to allocate the funds. Yeah, I just, because this one says ECAC and some other one said the housing trust. And so I, I just wondered if it's already been established that the primary responsibility for these things is with who it says there on the right-hand side, or if that's still up in the air? I would say nothing is finalized at this point. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> that's, sure. Um, you know, they're, they're sort of the, um, I think for this one in particular, ECAC was named because they came up with the, the resiliency plan. Um, and there's a lot of ideas in there that, that we would want to start making progress on. Um, so I think they were the logical one here, but I don't think that precludes some of these funds being allocated for other, other um, sustainability initiatives. Okay, thank you. Um, and then other things you might just be interested in. Um, we are also um, under this section, resident emergency aid and, um, and support. 
Uh, we're proposing the creation of a, a new position, uh, maybe a temporary position over a few years, um, a transition support coordinator. We envision this would be a position in town where um, one person would become sort of the expert on all the different assistance programs and services that exist in town. And this position um, would help walk people through some of the more complicated processes, whether it be applying for rental assistance or applying for unemployment or um, accessing other types of benefits. And this position would also look to identify if we have gaps in our social, our social service network um, and how we might be able to close those gaps. Um, and then the next one here we're also related is um, a resident emergency fund. So if, if somebody is having a uh, financial emergency or maybe another type of emergency caused by COVID, um, having a fund where, you know, we could provide temporary support for that person. We did a little bit of that through CARES and it was, um, seemed to be successful. And so, um, you know, it sort of depends how the pandemic goes forward, but um, we would continue something like that through this new grant as well. And so there's lots of other stuff. I don't know if you want me to go through other things that we're proposing, John, or if you just want to um, focus on the ones that I've described so far. Um, I, what you've done, as far as I'm personally concerned, is fine. But if other people have questions, I think they should raise them. John, do you have the slide uh, showing the chart of kind of the breakdown of the ARPA funds in general? Just, yeah. Yeah, so we, you know, we, this chart, you can see we've broken up the funds into a lot of different categories of expenditures That's because we got a lot of impact or we got a lot of input from different groups um, and that the impacts of the pan pandemic affected a lot of different areas, whether it be public health or housing or um, recreation opportunities for the youth. So um, the 12 million sounds like a lot when you, when you look at the, the large number that the town received, um, but when you start actually trying to allocate it to all the different areas where the pandemic has impacted the town, uh, it starts to shrink really quickly. Is that 12 million across three years? So right? it's 12 million and it has to be obligated by December 31st of 2024. And it has to be spent by December 31st of 2026. So that's, that's fiscal year 27. Uh, but, you know, it really could be five years potentially, um, you know, obligated if they, if they follow the way they've done it with other grants obligated would mean we have to have a contract in place um, by the end of 2024 that could go on for another two years. So I, Sean, this says round one allocates 80% of the grant funds. So the yeah. numbers that we just looked at, like the 1 million for something, is that does that mean there's still 20% left that isn't included in those numbers in the other pages? Yep, no, that's a good question. Um, so we intentionally with this first round, we only allocated 80% um, or roughly about 9 million of the grants. And we held back 20% to do a, um, with the thought that we would do a similar process one year from now. And the reason we would do that is one, if there are any more revenue issues in town on the municipal side, um, these funds can help close revenue gaps. So we had a big revenue issue last year with our enterprise funds, water and sewer coming in much lower because the college and universities closed. Um, so we're holding money back for that potential. Um, we wanted to hold it back in case there are other ideas that come up um, after this first round that we may wanna fund. And then we're holding it back in case there are strategies that we were proposing here that ultimately we start working on. And if any of them are really successful or maybe cost a little bit more than we thought, we wanted to have funds that we could go back to and allocate a little bit more um, um, to those strategies. So yeah, this first round is 80% and we were thinking that 20% we would allocate a year from now. Thank or, you. Or, or it could be sooner, it, you know, depending on what, what the need is. Hey, Sean, Laura Baker asked in the chat if using ARPA funds triggers uh, public bidding or prevailing wage. Uh, if it's for public construction, any type of construction, yeah, we would have to do prevailing wage. Um, if it's over 10,000, we would, you know, we'd have to follow all the procurement rules that we would normally follow. Mm -hmm. So, Sean, uh, this is not a criticism, it's a question. Under housing, you have really two bullets. One is explore opportunities to expand affordable housing stock, and the other is work collaboratively with the housing trust to develop housing assistance programs. Those are um, pretty open-ended. 
Mm -hmm. which I think is a good thing. Um, does that mean you're looking to the housing trust to uh, th thresh out or kind of add additional detail to those general ideas? Yeah, so, so what I said at the council um, is that some of the proposed spending allocations are really specific when you look at some of the other categories and then some are really broad. Um, and the ones that are really broad, like the housing one and the homeless, homelessness one, um, it's because they're, they're big problems and they're, they're big issues and that they're going to require more planning and collaboration with you all um, to develop what we actually want to do. So, you know, th those funds will be sort of in the, the Dave Z, Nate Malloy world, and I'm sure, um, you know, they're going to work uh, collaboratively with you all to figure out the best way to use those funds. Um, we submitted, I can't remember, seven or eight ideas related to both housing and homelessness. And they kind of look like they're represented here, um, but I'm a little uncertain. Do you want to say- We didn't want to include any of those ideas. So, so, that, so we, again, we wrote, it, we wrote it broadly so that um, the ideas that you have submitted are not, um, they're not, impossible based on what we wrote here, that, that what we wrote here can encompass those ideas, um, but that we just need more time to think about them and plan how we would do them. You know, a good, like, like I said, going back to the, um, the idea about retrofitting apartments and, um, and making them more energy efficient. Um, it's a great idea. It's just, it's a really big program and, and thinking about how we would set that up, how we would structure it, who we would work with, um, how, Again, operationally, all that would work. It just requires more planning time than what we had uh, in order to get this first round of um, spending allocations ready. Well, with respect to those ideas, <clears throat> do you want us to write something further about all of them, a subset of them? Um, what would be helpful to you in your process at this point in time? So I think um, a couple of things, well, one main thing, I think looking at the funds that have been earmarked, um, you know, how would you prioritize what you have submitted so far? So the, of the programs and the initiatives that you have submitted, um, would development of new affordable housing be number one? Would the, would the retrofits be, you know, what is the highest priority or, or the top two or three priorities um, of the programs that you've submitted, I think would be helpful feedback for the town manager and the assistant town manager. Um, you know, as we look to finalize a spending plan. Okay, and you said the spending plan would be presented to town council in November. Yeah, so this month of October is sort of all That's about to back on it. And okay. um, uh, finalize a plan and make some adjustments to this and present it in November, a final version. So we have a meeting roughly a month from now and uh, uh, we could try to make some decisions this evening or we could make tentative decisions and then try to firm them up at our next meeting, which I think is November 11th. Is that soon enough for you or is that not? Um, it might be, I'm trying to think of the meetings in November. I think the um, 15th, I'm not sure if there's a meeting before the 15th. I know the 15th is the financial indicators meeting. Um, so the 11th would probably be fine. Okay. I'll, double, I'll double check after this and let you know if it's not, but I would, I think based on what I know that meeting to be, that that's, that should be enough time. Okay. Well, we'll talk about this immediately uh, among ourselves. Obviously you can stay for that discussion and also provide any advice that you might have, uh, which certainly would be helpful. Yeah. But I think our goal would be to write out, uh, maybe a little bit more in the way of description and thinking a little bit more about the budget that might be allocated to each of these elements. Yeah, and, and I can give you, I mean, you, I'm sure you all have done a little bit of um, review of it, but I can also, based on your discussion, give you guide whether something might be eligible or not eligible um, under the, the ARPA rules. Um, I think most of what you submitted had some had a category where it could be eligible, but just in case it starts going into a, if there's new ideas, I can help with that. Yeah, that was my impression from looking at stuff that Chapa had uh, distributed that uh, anything that we had thought of, someone else in the country is already doing right. or planning to do. 
Yeah. The, the one caution I'll say is sometimes it depends where you're doing it, whether it's eligible or not. Um, for example, um, there are things that we could do in Amherst where we could where we could say it's focusing on a, an area where there's a lot of poverty or a lot of um, uh, where the, the income levels are particularly low um, that another town might not be able to do that same project if they don't have that area. Um, one of the things earlier in the in the presentation is this qualified census tract. Right. So whenever we spend the ARPA monies, we have to justify for certain categories, we have to justify that we're spending it on the hardest hit communities. And the way that ARPA does it is they say, if you spend money in a qualified census tract, then it sort of pre-qualifies it as hitting, as being spent on a hard hit community. If you spend it outside of a qualified census tract, then you have to, we have to come up with an alternative rationale for, you know, how those funds are being targeted that way. So, you know, one of the things I talked with Nate before um, we work on this presentation is that you can see we've lost a qualified census tract um, from 2021 <laughs> to 2022 and sort of a, a key area of the town. So, um, so it doesn't leave us a whole lot of room, but again, that doesn't mean we have to focus the money in this one purple area for 2022. It just means we have to be prepared with an alternative um, argument or data that can justify it being in another part of town. Sean, I have yeah. a question. With, with respect to increasing affordable housing, what if the trust or the town wanted to give money to a developer, you know, 300,000 or half a million to, if, they, if they're already moving forward with a project, is that eligible? Like just, would you have to like RFP, you know, like? Yeah, I mean, you'd have to probably do a request for proposals. I don't see that that would be um, inherently not eligible. Again, if, if, the, if you're using the money to expand affordable housing stock, um, there, I think, you know, if it's going towards construction, essentially, then I think that's okay. It's just, you know, okay. it's, hard, it's hard to increase affordable housing without, you know, actually building units or preserving units. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, or like a home buyer program, perhaps with the deed restriction, but there's, there's probably a few ways to do it. It's just, you know, typically the town wouldn't be doing those programs. You know, we'd be providing right. funds to an outside agency. Yeah, no, again, I think that's fine. I think, again, it, you know, if the effect of the funds is to, to build new units or expand units, then I think that qualifies under the, um, the criteria. Mm -hmm. um, historically, when we've wanted to develop homeowner units, there seems to be a requirement uh, that there be a deed restriction that often runs against the goal of allowing uh, people to accumulate wealth. Uh, because the, the whatever money has been spent has somehow got to go back to the town or at least some portion of it, uh, particularly with CPA funds. Do you see that as an issue with these funds? Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to, I don't know. I'd have to see, look into what you're talking about more to know if that would be an issue with this. Um, yeah, so typically with like a CPA funds, there's a permanent restriction or there's like a resale provision. So they'd have to, you know, basically give get the money back. So they really don't earn any equity even as a homeowner, right? So at the time of sale, they really. So we're talking about if the units are, instead of rent um, units for rent, these would be for home, sale. Units. Right. Home ownership units. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would have to look more into the, uh, the rules of the grant. I don't, I haven't seen anything that says that. Um, one of the things with ARPA that's different than CARES is ARPA, there's really no, there's not a lot of state technical support for ARPA like there was for CARES. CARES, they ran through the state and we, there was a state office assigned to it and we could talk with people at the state and run, and they would approve our ideas. Um, with, with ARPA, they're basically saying, no, you've got to go to the treasury and the treasury is not really weighing in on whether something's eligible or not. They're saying just read the um, read the the interim final rule and then eventually the final rule. Um, and so I haven't seen anything like that in that in, in that data so far in that text. But I'll, I'll take another look. Right, because hey, typically we use CPA or CBG funds. Right, we have a, a certain year, like a, you know, we might have a fifteen or a permanent deed restriction. But for instance, like with ARPA funds, we need to even have a restriction or could it be a five-year restriction? I mean, so, you know, something like that would, would make it a lot easier to use these funds for some programs possibly because it doesn't have, you know, all the kind of the red tape associated with other funding programs. 
Yeah, I just don't know how, you know, if, if we're spending it under the under the eligibility criteria of affordable housing, you know, is there a way to make sure that 10 years from now it's still affordable housing? Um, I, I, right. That's, that's probably what the, you know, from a grant perspective, they would want to make sure that it's, you know, sort of affordable housing in perpetuity or at least for, you know, a lot longer than five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is on, Kara? Or th there are ways to write those things so that the whatever appreciation or whatever happens to the home, it's shared between the homeowner and getting the grant money back. I mean, if the if the market tanks, then I don't know what happens. But in other circumstances, it's not like the homeowner necessarily gets nothing just because there's some kind of a deed restriction. It depends somehow some on how the deed restriction works. But yeah, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, we don't want the grant money back. That's for sure, especially after the grant's over. Because if we get the mon grant money back, it probably has to go back to the to the federal government at that point. So we, we definitely don't want the money back. Okay. Well, that's certainly helpful to know. Um, are there other questions from Sean? I I think this might be a really dumb question, but. Um, the way the housing thing is written right now, because it says increase affordable housing stock, and at least our project of retrofitting rental units so that they're more efficient is not going to increase the stock. And yet it's a thing that I, I at least, and I think we talked about a lot and would really like to be able to have be a project, but I don't know where it fits exactly under the guidelines and maybe I don't have to worry about that. But right now I'm like, that's not gonna increase housing stock. And, yeah. and a lot of the things that would increase housing stock might take too long to be actually spent by the time they have to be spent by. So, so, so that program in particular, I was thinking we would fall under the housing assistance program bullet. Um, you know, not, okay. I was thinking that bullet would be broader than just the traditional housing assistance, like rental assistance, that retrofitting, um, apartments to, to reduce utility costs could also fall under that bucket if that's the, the direction we decide to go in. Okay. Okay. Well, also, Carol, if we could get the landlord or building owner to share the savings with the renter so that the rental amount is decreased to some extent, that would increase affordable housing stock, particularly if that reduction in rent um, goes on for a number of years. Uh huh. At least it would make it the same place that was affordable might be affordable to someone at a lower level of income. Exactly. Or some. Yeah. Thank you. That makes sense. I mean, that's an interesting trick that we have to figure out how to do. <laughs> but it's certainly been part of my thinking with respect to that. Well, hey, Sean, Nate. Yeah. Sorry. I was there, uh, you know, Representative Dom is here, and she suggested, you know contacting McGovern's office if we do need more assistance with, um, you know, guidance and also, you know, is wealth generation, could that be um, a goal, you know, in addition to, or, you know, affordable housing. So does that make a difference in terms of housing, um, you know, how it's, how it's targeted uh, and what it's used for? I mean, I think, I think the housing piece is just so broad. It's really interesting, you know, you know, home ownership is expensive. So, you know, on a, Per unit basis, you don't get a lot in terms of dollars spent, but it's really beneficial. And then, you know, we have what we've done a lot of rental development. And so, I mean, I think there's a, a range of needs. And so I, I guess, you know, I don't know if it's this, you know, staff in the trust, try, you know, prioritize a few programs or a few ideas, because um, really the housing money, you know, it may not go that far, right? It sounds like a lot, but, um, you know, and then, uh, same with homelessness. I mean, if, you know, if there's an idea, you know, in terms of sheltering or trans transitional housing, those are costly endeavors too. So, you know, I just, I just want to make sure, John, that we're realistic, right? That maybe it's like, there's four activities that are undertaken, right? Three or four and not, you know, we're not, you know, we had eight ideas, which maybe some of those activities can satisfy a few of those, but not, you know, I'm not, I don't know. That's a perfect segue, Nate. What I wanted to do was put the set of eight ARPA ideas that we submitted to Sean in front of everybody and run the list to see if right here and now we can do two things. One, decide, okay, 
here are the ones that we're most likely to have as a priority, as well as identifying individual members of the trust who are um, willing and able to do a little bit more research on how to describe that initiative and uh, what the budget might be. So if we could do that, um, and I might be able to share that on my screen. I, I think, am I sharing We've it? got it. Oh, you got it. Okay, you beat me to it. That's great. Because I'm not that proficient in sharing screen. Okay, so there we are, A through G, that's what we submitted. Um, now, from the point of view of the housing trust, there are two B and C that are already on Sean's list in the area of uh, homelessness initiatives. So we don't have to cut those out. On the other hand, um, we could do separate descriptions of those in order to shore up whatever it is that Sean will have in thinking about what those could be. And then we have six more that uh, we would put under the housing. And as Nate was saying, six is probably too many. So let me go through them. Uh, the first one is weatherization and retrofitting heating systems for affordable housing units. Um, obviously, I'm interested in that and would be willing to write it up. Um, I think that this would not be the end of what we would want to do in this area, but I think having getting the town to have some experience with pushing ahead an initiative like this would be worthwhile. So this may be something that we would set aside for a $500,000 or maybe a little bit less, but that's my uh, view. Then we have B and C. I don't know if anybody wants to help to write those up so that we have additional feedback or information to provide to Sean on those two ideas. I mean, we can do that. It's already in his list, so we don't necessarily have to, but it might strengthen it if somebody's interested in doing that. Isn't there a group meeting about this? <laughs> Allegra and I well. talked about that. It hasn't met. Um, with some of the staffing changes at town hall, there hasn't been continuity in the meeting but I would not mind um, doing a little follow-up and at least seeing where Craig Stores has landed with some of the work that they've been doing. And um, That would be great if you could follow up with Kevin Noonan. Super. Because uh, Kevin may already be writing something, so there's no point in being redundant on either or both of those issues. Yeah, and we did, um, just to jump in real quickly, um, Kevin spoke at one of the listening sessions and voiced uh, support for um, B, well, B and C, really. Okay. So I've, I've documented that, and I can, when I write up all the feedback that we have received, that'll be part of it. Okay, well, Allegra, I appreciate your volunteering to look into this, and if necessary, collaborating with Kevin on writing something up. Okay, so we're up to D, uh, mortgage subsidies and grants for first time home buyers. CPA has funded a program like this in the past, and actually it is currently funding a program um, for which Valley Community Development is the grantee. So I could work with Laura to um, figure this one out. Yeah, more likely budget. Donna than Laura. Oh, Donna, okay. Yeah. All right, if you can just give me the contacts, I will follow up on that one. Okay, yeah, it's Donna Cabana or DC at uh, uh, Valley Community Development. Yeah, we can just use their CPA proposal from last year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, could you send that to me? And <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, purchase property or construction of affordable housing for home ownership opportunities. By coincidence, 
I was talking to Laura Baker today and she has an idea that uh, might fit with that. Um, they're looking around town for a potential property to purchase and she would wanna follow through with that um, if the property, if there is property that's gonna be available. They're not committed to that now, but it's great to know that Valley Community Development is already looking in that direction. Um, so, Sean, this could be, so yeah, say for instance, say Valley, you know, or you know, we, um, you know, we have proposals out for the East Street School Belchertown Road site, and say a developer comes in, you know, would the ARPA money be available to go to that project? You know, like how how does it work to to use money that way. I think if the project doesn't happen without the ARPA funds, um, then we could use the ARPA funds in that way. Again, I'd have to, you know, once we get more specific on what we're gonna do with it, I'll have to um, verify it's all eligible. But I think in general, based on what I've read, if, if that's what, if using the money is what creates the affordable housing, then that would be an allowable use. So there are potentially yeah. two opportunities under E. Mm -hmm. Which, which me, means it's something we should probably want to include. Um, I'll work on it, but not without a whole lot of help from somebody who knows what they're doing. Okay. Uh, I'm doing a lot of other stuff. Is there anybody else who could work with Carol on that? You could also uh, contact Laura Baker and see if she can provide any advice on writing that up without uh, suggesting specific uh, information about the project she's looking to create. And of course, you already know a lot about Belchertown Road East Street School, Carol. So I'm not sure you need to uh, any help with that. It's really more as Nate was saying, well, if the developer needs another half a million dollars, can we take it out of ARPA? I guess. I just don't have even the faintest idea how to start writing something like that. But if somebody has any models or anything that's vaguely like it or anything to give me, I would greatly appreciate it because I'm uh, the thing that's different about it from what we've done is that it's property for affordable home ownership opportunities, which seems different i mean habitat does that i guess but yeah. i don't i don't know so yeah well, we're also thinking about a project on strong street so if that town property um is identified as developable that is there aren't problems with the property that would make it hard to do development there that would be something else we wouldn't have to purchase the property but we might need funds for construction so I think we have three opportunities potentially under E. Um, and while we can't commit to anyone at this moment in time, uh, just the fact that we have three opportunities should suggest that this is a strong candidate for support. I think the only downside is whether we can uh, obligate and spend the money on the timeline that Sean described. Yeah, we'd have the R uh, if the ARPA money would were used to either buy the property or do something in the early stages of the project, and it's spent even though the project hasn't been completed yet. Does that count that it's spent before twenty six, even though the project's not finished? Um, I don't know the answer. I would. Uh, I'm leaning towards that would be okay as long as we can only spend money for services provided. So, you know, we would be spending on, on work that's already done. Um, I haven't seen anything that says the, I'll have to look and see if there's any clause in there that says we have to start receiving the beneficial use of the expenditure before a certain date. Um, CARES had some of that language in it, which was a little shorter of a grant, but they, they had language that said we had to receive the benefit of whatever we spent the money on. Um, but with things like affordable housing, which, like you said, take a lot longer, um, I'll have to look and just see if there's anything in the, in the rules about that. Okay, thanks. Oh, yeah, I mean, for instance, we could just spend it 
we could write the developer a check and it's gone, but is that, you know, is that sufficient? Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's easy enough to obligate it and actually get it out the door, but is it, and does it satisfy, satisfied if the units actually aren't occupied or, you know, fully built, I guess. Right. Yeah, I mean, purchase of land would be relatively easy, right? That would be much easier. But if it's for construction, that's I can see where it would take longer. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully we can write something up under E, and that will give Sean a better basis for judging uh, whether there are any potential pitfalls in allocating ARPA funding for E. Okay, F. Home ownership funding to maintain or stay in property. Can we refresh my memory? Was this like if somebody had a COVID related loss and was behind on their mortgage or something like that, we would provide funding so that they wouldn't go into foreclosure? Or? I don't recall either, but that makes sense to me as an explanation? I thought it was more where seniors actually, um, many want to stay, but sometimes the cost of, um, you know, the, uh, the taxes and the maintain maintenance of the house sometimes pushes people out of their homes. Um, that's what I thought it was more about. It, it could sorry, be either or both of what you, the two of you are describing. John Allegra mentioned mm -hmm. the impacts of COVID. It, are ARPA funds, do we have to explain or um, justify them as a because of an impact from COVID and that the use of funds are to mitigate that? Um, for some things, yeah, you do. I think, I mean, affordable housing is one that's explicitly outlined in the in the rules as um, you know, the pandemic had an impact on housing and made the housing ish the housing problem worse. Um, so that's why sort of affordable housing is an allowable initiative. In terms of the um, providing funding, if there's an emergency situation, I think that that's sort of covered under the, the resident assistance page that I showed. Um, and that's sort of what we did with CARES as well, where if somebody had a, you know, was out of work because they had a quarantine and they couldn't um, make a mortgage payment or something, um, those funds, that's what that pot of money was intended for. Um, so we've got a little bit of this already in the spending plan. Right. I mean, I, you know, I was thinking like aging in place when Eric was mentioning seniors, but, you know, for instance, is funding, funding that eligible for ARPA? I mean, you could say well, that you know, Lord, not you. households with uh, limited, you know, in, income, you know, and money's fungible, like they, you know, they may have lost some income somewhere, so they couldn't spend the money on, you know, maintaining their housing. So it's like, you know, how, you know, how, how justifiable something like that. Yeah. I mean, we have to, it def, like I said, it, no matter what we do, we have to focus it on the, um, for the most part on the hardest hit community. So we just, if we, I'll have to look into that type of program more oh, to see. I see. Cool, but, it wasn't really a big, so uh, Fuck you. I'm not sure how many people are jumping <laughs> to, uh, to write about this one, but. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking that we do have to narrow and maybe this is a place to narrow. Um, with respect to G, I think we agreed that that is not a specific program, but it should be incorporated into the things we are going to propose. So G should be part of A, G should be part of uh, D. D and E, yeah. um, but not a separate initiative. Yeah. So I have a question just based on um, Nate and Sean, what you were just talking about. Uh, so in writing this, we should use the COVID-19 lens. Um, okay, so I think that's important because you know, with A, it's the same thing in terms of weatherization and retrofitting heating systems, you have to sort of think about, okay, COVID-19 impact um, and A, and I'm doing D, so I have to think about that as well. Um, and that's going to be a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a stretch. So maybe what I'll do, um, Erica and John is I'll send the, the group that this whole group, the, um, 
the language from the interim rule, which talks about these types of programs, just so you can see what what the what the intent was for for this area, and it's it's actually written in a you know easy to follow type of way. Um, it's not too uh, wordy, so I, I will I'll send that to you all um, tomorrow so that you have it, and and that might help guide how you describe the programs. Okay, thanks, Sean. That sounds really helpful. Okay, so I'm gonna do take the lead on A. It sounds like um, Carol will take the lead on D. I'm sorry, Erica will take the lead on D and Carol will take the lead on E. And I mean, both of you can consult with me or with Nate on how to try to structure that. Um, and I'd probably do a review of anything before our next meeting in any case. Sure, and John, Laura Baker has her hand raised. Okay. Hi, Laura, you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, comedy of errors. I was trying to reply to Carol. <laughs> no, I didn't mean to raise my hand. <laughs> All oh. right. Okay. John, can I say one final thing? Um, Absolutely. Um, the, the one other thing just for everyone to keep in mind as we look at these programs, and, and this is one of the things that um, Mindy helped with and some of the other legislators we've spoken to have advised is um, just be conscious of um, the state has a lot of ARPA money too, and they haven't really come out with their plan of how they're going to allocate those <laughs> funds, but they have a lot. And so we want to do, we're not going to be able to do it perfectly, but as best we can, we want to try to focus our funds on the things where there may not be state funding for in a few months. Um, and so again, it's not going to be, we're not really going to have a ton of uh, success with that potentially because they haven't come out with a plan and we sort of need to start moving forward with it. Um, but just keep that in mind that the state is also going to have a lot of money um, and I imagine it will trickle down and there will be some home, home programs or housing programs that get funding from the state as well. Great. Yeah, I think that's a great, an excellent point, Sean. And to some extent, some of these things that we're proposing, uh, maybe, you know, you could increase or decrease or trade across the proposals depending upon what happens with the state, because whatever we do, we're not going to spend it in December, right. even if you put it in your November spending plan. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. I would be shocked if you did that. Modify. If we find out the state's going to fund something, yeah, we can we can uh, adjust accordingly. Yep, that's great. Okay, so uh, I I didn't mention that Allegra is going to do B and C on my wrap up. Um, but this is great. I think we've made a lot of progress here and. Uh, Sean, I really appreciate your coming and talking with us. Uh, I think it's put us in a better position to try to support the town's process for deciding what to do going forward. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. So I think we're ready to go on to the next agenda item. Um, we're starting to kind of get squeezed a little bit, but we'll get through as much of the agenda as we can before nine o'clock. Um, I believe, Nate, the next agenda item is uh, CPAC money, right? Sure, yeah, I mean, we said we might be able to wait. I know Dave Zomax here, um, the Housing Authority doesn't look like they're in attendance, but you know, the agenda did have discussion of the um, FY23 CPA proposal. So we could, we could invite Dave in. Um, well, I think we should we should talk about um, what Dave has submitted. I know I have comments on it, and other people may as well. So I don't think it's a mistake to give it some time this evening. And uh, with respect to any of these things, we might postpone until our November meeting, making actual decisions about what to recommend to CPAC. Right. Uh, because there could be changes in proposals. As you said, the AHA is not here this evening. We might want to invite them uh, to our November meeting. Um, yeah, I reached out to them for this meeting too. I think they've been really busy, so I didn't, I didn't hear back, but. Okay, well, I, I don't think there's a lot 
is that we need to discuss about the trust proposals. I'll just briefly mention, because we've gone over these in some detail um, a couple of months ago, that there are two, there's half a million dollars we're asking for to be allocated to the trust for support of future projects without necessarily saying, because we've done this in the past, exactly what those projects will be. And then the other thing, which is small, but very important is $30,000 for support of consulting services over two years. So I have no reason to believe that anybody has questions or concerns about those. If they do, then we can talk about them at the next meeting. So I think we should just move on to uh, focus on the two town proposals, particularly since Dave has graciously come to join us this evening. Sure, I will just say quickly, you know, I spoke with Sonia today and the, you know, as always, there's, you know, more money requested than available from CPA. So I think there's probably, you know, twice as much uh, money requested in proposals as is available. So, um, you know, the CPA committee, you know, will need to make recommendations and then, the, you know, that goes through the council process. So, you know, maybe all of them could be funded uh, are partially funded or some may not be funded. So I think, you know, there are quite a few proposals this year. Right. Well, there are two town proposals. Um, one is for half a million dollars for support of transitional housing. And the other is $100,000 for support of new part-time housing staff over a period of three years. But I, I don't wanna talk about them. I um, want uh, Dave to present them to us and then we can ask questions. Oh. Thanks, John. Um, I, I, I enjoyed listening to the previous conversation about ARPA funds. Um, and I did just want to comment there was, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, there was clear. Um, there was reference to the uh, committee, um, I don't know, recall the official name, but the committee focused on homelessness that Mary Beth Ogilevitz was uh, staffing. And um, I have yet to reestablish a regular meeting for that group. Uh, honestly, um, as the fall has quickly approached and November 1st has quickly approached, the real focus has been on getting a congregate shelter open and supporting Greg's doors. So uh, with just a couple of weeks uh, till November 1st, that has been our major focus, but that group um, will meet again. And uh, Mary Beth did provide me with some of the uh, materials that she was developing before she left the town service. So um, the town did put in two CBA proposals. When I told John I was coming tonight, I I did not think I would be presenting those to the to the trust tonight. So um, I said I was coming to the meeting to listen and and comment. But I'm I'm happy to discuss them in general. I don't know, John. Did you share them with all the members? Yes, I did, but um, kind of at a late date, I shared okay. them. Well, if the uh, trust would like a formal presentation on them, we I think Nate and I would be happy to, obviously Nate is here with you each uh, each meeting, but I'd be happy to come back and, and we could talk in more detail, but I can quickly review them. So first off, um, the, the town did put in a proposal um, for $100,000 to establish a, um, a housing coordinator position, a part-time housing coordinator position uh, within the planning department of, of the town. Uh, it would be for three years. Um, and really this is all about capacity building. Um, you know, we've, we've had some good success working with the trust over the last year, um, moving forward on the Belchertown Road project, which um, was a heavy lift for all of us, but um, we got it done in, in record time and very short order. And um, we were able to then combine that with the East Street School uh, property. And, and the feeling is that um, there's only so much of Nate uh, to go around. And uh, we would very much like to have somebody working with Nate, working with myself, working with the other planning staff and supporting the work that you all do um, day to day here to try to really ramp up our efforts. Um, you know, the, the council just approved their comprehensive housing um, policy for the entire town. And there's some pretty, you know, uh, aggressive goals and timelines and, 
and it, it sets the bar very high for all of us. So the feeling is that we'd like to bring some of that uh, energy in, in the building and really add to the work that Nate does and some of the other staff. Um, I don't think this would compete with the trust proposal for uh, consulting um, um, support. I think it would only augment and supplement and complement uh, the work that Rita does for you. So that was proposal one. Um, proposal two is, as John mentioned, um, you know, and, and really it did come up in the ARPA discussion as well. Um, you know, I've been working closely with Greg's Doors for a number of years. I, I worked um, very hard with Mary Beth uh, to, to begin to identify some of the longer term needs. And, you know, um, I've been around the sheltering table for a long time. And I think the bottom line is that um, we, we are concerned about the, the sustainability of the efforts at Greg's Doors. We really need to come up with a long-term plan that moves people who are experiencing homelessness from that, from where they are to supportive transitional housing. And Craig's Doors mission is not to do that really. That is not uh, their comprehensive mission. Their mission is to save people's lives and shelter them during a six month period. And they've done a wonderful job doing that. But we're really missing that piece of moving those people from um, where they are to getting them into uh, some supportive housing. And so we asked for half a million dollars as really seed money uh, to begin to look at a property or multiple properties that might uh, serve two functions. One would be for a modest congregate shelter with some um, long-term supportive uh, transitional housing attached or as part of um, uh, that development. So it might, it might include looking at the UML, it might include looking at some other properties in Amherst. And my staff and I have already started doing some of that assessment around town of buildings that might, might work for that. It might also mean uh, acquiring a property and either renovating or uh, building new. So that's kind of where we are. And I think it kind of dovetails nicely with uh, some of the discussion that was uh, um, uh, had with Sean Mangano about the ARPA funds. So half a million dollars isn't gonna get us there. It would really be seed money to move us forward. Um, but overall, I think our concern and Mary Beth Ogilovitz identified uh, really that the long-term need is, is for transitional housing. And um, this year to year, this year to year rush, this year to year struggle, um, you know, is, is something that many communities are doing, but we need more uh, transitional housing in town if we're gonna make a, make a dent in, in this challenge. So that's where we are. I have a few comments, Dave. Um, when you described this to me verbally, I was pretty enthusiastic. But honestly, after reading the details of the proposal to CPAC, I, I see some potential problems. And I'll begin with the um, program for transitional housing. As far as I understand, and I could be wrong, I think that CPA funds can only be used to fund permanent affordable housing. I don't think they can be used for transitional housing. And I know you kind of use both language or both ideas in the proposal to CPA, C, but I, I think you, you need to stick with the idea of uh, permanent affordable housing for CPA funds. Now with ARPA, you may not have the same requirement. There was clearly some ambiguity, ambiguity based on the conversation with Sean. You might be able to build a shelter or build transitional housing with ARPA funds, but I don't think it would be allowable under CPA funds. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, no, that's something that we've been talking about internally a little bit. And, and before we go before CPA, we will clarify that. Okay. Um, anybody can interrupt me. Um, 
I, I was a little bit concerned that the trust and town proposals in some respect seem to be in direct competition. And let me express some of the specific reservations I have. We have gradually been losing the valuable time of Nate Malloy over the last year, particularly. And that's because Nate has been asked to do uh, work on new zoning proposals. I can understand entirely why you would ask him to do that. Um, on the other hand, um, I think it's been a bit of a loss for the housing trust. Uh, and that's not a criticism of Nate. It's, you know, what he's been asked to do. And I'm concerned that if you bring in a new part-time person who has the title of housing coordinator, we will continue to see an attrition in the time that Nate devotes to the housing trust. And I know that may not be your intention, but I can easily see how the time could slide into that. Yeah, I, I don't see it as a, as a net loss. I see it as a net gain, John. I mean, all over the Commonwealth, I mean, I, I don't know how many communities are, are, are utilizing this model, but a number of communities are adding part-time or full-time housing coordinators to their planning departments. And I just, I just see it as an opportunity to add uh, bandwidth, energy, time. Um, again, I would go back to the Belchertown Road project and really say, you know, that was a, a short-term heavy lift and it took a lot of my time and Nate's time and Rob Mora's time to make that happen. Um, I just see it as if we had more staff time, it's it can only be a plus I, for I, all of our I, efforts. I definitely agree with that. Um, so I guess what I would like for myself and the other uh, trust members, some assurance is that it is more. It's not going to be an opportunity to ask Nate to do more on zoning. <laughs> you have my assurance, no, that, that is not the, the intent here at all. Um, I can't say what the, I can't say what 2022 is gonna be like for zoning. Um, a lot of that will be determined by the council. Um, the council uh, is the driver when it comes to zoning changes. Um, I will also say that some of that work in zoning is a good portion of it is about housing. So it's a little hard to tease these apart. So, you know, we're, whether we're working on inclusionary zoning or simply adding to the housing stock in Amherst, all of those things have benefits for affordability. So Nate's been right in the mix on housing every step of the way, but again, what, what initiatives we work on with regard to zoning will largely be determined by the priorities of the, of the new council when they are sworn in on January 3rd. But again, this is intended to be a net gain, John, not a net loss. So it doesn't okay. mean if we got this funding, Nate would slip away and you would never see him again. Well, that is exactly my concern. So I wanted to express it. <laughs> no, Nate has a hard time letting go. I will tell you that. He, he, oh, I he don't holds disagree. on to things. He holds on to things very dearly. He, he, I've been trying to get him to let go of some other things, and honestly, he won't let go of them. So I'll, I, stick, I have with a housing, feeling. I'll stick with the housing trust, John. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think that there are a lot of things happening in town, you know, in, in the planning department. So next year, there's, a, you know, we hope to have a lot more products and activities. So. I see the housing coordinator position as helping, um, you know, even just administering CPA fund uh, funding activities, you know, housing activities takes a little bit of time. So, you know, there's a few homebuyer programs that are happening. There's um, rental subsidy programs. And that's, that's just, you know, that's a lot of staff time um, administering those. So I think something the housing coordinator could help with that. Uh, and as Dave said, just be able, we could then, you know, extend our capacity for other projects. Well, that is the outcome I would like to see, just expressing my concern. Um, another area of concern, well, I understand and I appreciated the fact, Dave, that you began with a discussion of the recent cooperation 
and not only recent, but really historical con cooperation between the town and the housing trust. Um, there was absolutely no mention of that in either of your proposals. And in fact, if anything, there were some elements that led me to feel, well, do you value the housing trust? Uh, do you continue to think that we need to have a housing trust in town? Um, and I'll quote something directly from one of the proposals. The town believes that housing a part time, having a part time staff person who works within the Office of Conservation and Development, and specifically the planning department, will be a more effective approach to help meet the housing goals of the community. And then it goes on to, under, to describe tasks that have been undertaken by both the trust and its consultant. So what I'm concerned is the message to CPAC is that uh, the housing trust and its consul consultant may no longer be considered as necessary as it once was in the past. Um, how do I answer that, John? Um, <laughs> By promising to revise that paragraph, Dave. <laughs> I don't know. I, I need to re. I need to re reread them all. I need to reread your proposals as well. Um, and it's, I'll, you know, I've known Rita for a long time. I think I can be honest on this call, but I think, I honestly think Rita brings a different service to you than a housing coordinator would bring to the town and to you. Rita has a, a particular set of skill sets. Um, and I think we're talking about embedding this position within the planning department. That's where, I mean, discussions go on daily, weekly, monthly, that neither Rita nor you nor the trust members can be part of. I want to increase that level of, of uh, energy and focus and, and product by bringing in additional hours of a professional. So. I, I just see these as as complementary positions. Not they're you know uh, we never intended these to be competing uh, priorities. They they should complement uh, that work. And again, from a sustainability standpoint, I honestly and Rita's on the call. I don't know how long Rita is going to consult with the trust. So my job is to try to build. Uh, capacity within the town to continue the good work that the trust is currently doing, Rita is doing, I'm doing, Nate is doing for many, many years to come. And I worry a little bit that we sometimes that we, it's hard to build capacity when you're, when consultants can come and go, right, Rita, whenever, when, when they want to. So, so I don't know how long. I hope Rita stays with the trust in the town for many, many years, but I can't guarantee that. Where, whereas I think if we can build some additional capacity within the town focused specifically on affordable housing, that to me seems like only a positive. Does well, that make sense? As you described the proposals to me, you know, a few days ago or a week ago, whenever it was, um, I saw it the same way. As I said, my problem really has to do not with the way you're describing it now, but the way that it is written up, the way it's described on the pages going to CPAC. And I am concerned that the way it's described undermines both the position of the trust and the position of our consultant, which I personally highly value. I mean, as whenever, do I, as do I, yeah. Whenever. Uh, or whoever you're able to, to uh, find to fill this job, it's not going to be a person who has over 30 years of experience in affordable housing and valuable contracts among former colleagues and friends throughout the state of Massachusetts. So uh, we need to do nothing in my judgment to discourage Rita from continuing uh, or to discourage the 
uh, the Community Preservation Act committee from continuing to support that contract. Here's what I would say, John, to that is, you know, with all the discussion we've had as a community about affordable housing over the past five years, we should be, you know, we should be advocating for a full-time position, never mind a 20 hour a week position in the planning department. I think we need Rita, we need the trust, we need Nate, we need me. We need a full-time position that is solely focused on affordable housing within the town. And, and I used the word sustainability earlier uh, that I see having a, a position within the town as more sustainable, but keep in mind funding it through CPA is not, it may be more sustainable, but it's not, you know, this might only be for three years and then we'd have to go back to CPA as you do for Rita's position. But what I'm saying is with all the meetings, with all the reports, with all of the urgency and, and, um, and, and um, you know, crisis, the word crisis is being used. I think we need a full-time housing coordinator within the town of Amherst. Um, so I, I was being, cautious in asking for a part-time, but I think we should go together and say to the CPA committee, we need both. We need a consultant like Rita, Rita for the trust, and we need this part-time position. And we might come back in a year or two and say, it's working so well, we need a full-time position. That's, that's where I, that's kind well, of- Well, I, I would certainly agree. I will say that I got a set of questions from CPAC from Sonia Aldrich this morning and it includes the question, why don't you replace your consultant with a full-time town employee? I saw that. <laughs> so I think we should get together and we should make sure our, our responses to that are in sync and that we, you know, the CPAC needs to understand that this is a crisis. This is one of the most urgent needs facing the town of Amherst and we shouldn't be quibbling over two, you know, two part-time positions. We, we, should, we should devote more resources to this, to this uh, crisis in our community. That's my well, approach. I agree absolutely with what you just said. My only concern is that I would like to see it represented in your submission to CPAC. We will review those, uh, and honestly, I have not read them since they were submitted, yours or ours. So we'll reread those, John, and we can convene before they before we present to CPAC. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, okay, I've I've been monopolizing the conversation here. Uh, are there other questions that people have about the town proposals? could write about that email you just I'm sorry Carol well I I guess maybe I know the answer to this question from listening to what I just heard but I is it is it makes sense to fund a staff position on the kind of money that you get from CPA I and mean, what happens you you're, you're hiring somebody Usually when you hire somebody, there's kind of an expectation that you have the job until they don't, you're not doing it very well or something. But this job is like for three years. So if you become dependent on this position and then, and then it's not, I mean, Nate is funded out of whatever the general pot of money of the budget of the town, I presume. And, and so I'm, I'm a little concerned that you bring in somebody, get them doing a whole bunch of stuff and then whoops, they're gone. And then what the heck do you do? And I, and I, and I just want to say, in, along with what John has been saying, the need is great, but a whole lot depends on how it's presented. Because we might know the need is great, but you're presenting it to people who don't have whatever, it, aren't coming from where we're coming from. So I agree with John, it makes a whole lot of, it's very important what it looks like. It's very important that it is very clear in the way everything is written that these are uh, uh, augment each other and as opposed to being duplicative or any kind of thing like that. No, I, I, I agree with you. I think the CPAC is a very friendly and very supportive group. I've presented to them 
dozens and dozens of times through the years. And I think they fully understand the urgency of and the need for more affordable housing in all categories in, in town. To the point or to your question about um, funding and, and short-term funding, um, in all honesty, um, our municipalities fund positions like this all the time. We use uh, CPA funds, we use CDBG funds. Um, people in the functional area that I oversee have been paid for with CDBG funds for years, which are not guaranteed. And, and actually we've okay. lost those funds before. Now, is that the ideal? No, we would prefer to have these positions uh, be fully funded through tax support, but there are many, many town employees who, who are funded through various um, enterprise funds, which fluctuate as well as um, grants. So my goal would be is if we could show the CPAC, uh, the trust, the council, how valuable a part-time staff person could be in those three years, then we would go back to them and say, we'd like another three years or we'd like six years or whatever, you know, uh, whatever the approach would be at that point. But we would be able to show the work product and the success we've had with that position. Thank you. Okay, other comments in this area? If not, I'm gonna move on to the next agenda item and we'll take this up again when we meet in a month. Okay, I believe the next agenda item is Hickory Ridge. And uh, since I learned this from Dave, he can second uh, guess or re, uh, reclaim what he has to say. But uh, as I understand it, it looks like the town will close on a sale of Hickory Ridge in something like one to two months. I understand that's not guaranteed, but that's the latest prediction. Um, the town has held multiple on-site events, plus adding a place for public comment through the Engage Amherst website. Um, and again, I heard Dave say on Saturday when I was there that the plan is to write a master plan for Hickory Ridge within one year after the town acquires the property formally. So I think that's the plan. Uh, for Hickory Ridge, if people have had an opportunity to go to the Engage Amherst website, I don't know what the number is today, but there were probably at least 60, maybe 70 different comments that have been entered on that website. Um, I would say a preponderance of them have to do with affordable housing, uh, not all on affordable housing for older adults, but there were some significant number that focused on that as an idea as well. Um, we know, and again, Dave can correct me, uh, there is a commitment to something like, uh, I think 40 acres to be leased back to what will be the former owners of Hickory Ridge for a solar field. Um, there's additional large area that will be conservation, including a plan to do planting again as quickly as the town can once it acquires control of the property around the Fort River, which winds its way through the Hickory Ridge property. Um, and then there have been a lot of other proposals, not the least of which is developing uh, a proposal for adult affordable rental development at Hickory Ridge. Um, so um, are there comments or thoughts about uh, what's going on there that based on observations that any of you have made? John, could I just clarify a couple of notes in there? Absolutely. Yeah, so thanks everybody. Um, so yeah, we held three information sessions last week. It was called kind of Discover Hickory Ridge. Um, we're not, we're dropping the golf course now. It's the former golf course. Um, we had over 200 people come to those three sessions last Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Staff led short walks and, and there were some introductory remarks um, by me and, and some of the other staff. Um, we, we had a, what we thought was a great turnout, lots of good questions, comments. 
as John said, we have the Engage, um, Engage Hickory Ridge, which has, I think, close to 80 comments now, uh, ranging from affordable housing to zip lines to community gardens to dog parks to disc golf, um, and the list goes on and on. Full court basketball, um, uh, save all of the land, don't do anything with it, uh, uh, pollinator gardens, you name it, some great stuff. And that's really where we are right now, which is to gather lots of community input um, and then uh, create a structure for that input to kind of um, work its way into a master plan for the property. We do intend to do some additional outreach to particularly to the neighborhoods to the north. Um, we were just talking about that in a meeting today uh, to the brook, uh, to the uh, boulders, to um, help me out. I'm a little tired tonight, but there are uh, two other apartment South complexes. Point, Mill Valley. South Point and, and Mill Valley, thank you. Um, because we really felt as though the uh, residents there were, were underrepresented at these three information sessions. So we're, we're gonna do some outreach there. Um, uh, in terms of solar, John, the numbers were a little high. There will okay. be 26 acres of solar as Thank part of the you. project, uh, not 40. So we start with 150 acres total, 26 acres will be solar. Um, the town will lease that land. We will own it. The town will, but we'll lease that land for solar. We'll get between fifty and sixty thousand dollars a year in a pilot payment for that um, that leased land. Um, and then, as part of that project, the state, not the town, the state is requiring the solar company to mitigate for their impacts. So they will have to mitigate seventeen acres of riverfront. Uh, land along the Fort River will need to be restored to its former uh, habitat. Um, and that 17 acres will is required by the state to be permanently protected. So we go from 150 acres, 26 solar, 17 mitigation. Um, and those are some of the layers we begin to, uh, uh, Nate's put up a, a nice uh, image showing the crosshatched solar areas, uh, and then in green along the river, you can see the 17 acres of uh, mitigated uh, habitat. So from there, we then begin to look at the property, uh, topography, floodplain, riverfront, vernal pools, wetlands, anything that might um, limit the future uses. And then we'll kind of integrate all of that with some of the, the great ideas that were shared with us and continue to be shared. So. I think a, a master plan would take, you know, eight to 12 months to, to, to complete and we'll look to have the Housing Trust and the Conservation Commission and the Recreation Commission and any other boards and committees involved as this moves forward. So I think I'll stop there for questions or comments. But thanks, Nate, for finding that image. So questions or comments for Nate? I, I will say just quickly that you know, it's 150 acres, but, um, you know, most of the developable land is, you know, I think there's less than 10 acres, right? So the clubhouse, if people can see my cursor is here, there's a parking lot, and then there's some upland, you know, maybe along the road and over here near Amherst Office Park. So, Nate, you know, might do, you only be like orient, do you want to orient people's street name and everything just to, in case they haven't seen this map? Yeah, let me, um, this is West Pomeroy Lane. So um, over in this corner, I can't see, I don't know how much is visible, is um, is the intersection. Oh yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know if it's too bad. It's the map just, just ends at the intersection. So, um, you know, Pomeroy Lane and 116. And then this is heading west towards Hadley. So on your right, the north of West Pomeroy is the, is the, golf, the former golf course. And so, um, you know, it's a nice open area, but you know, my point I was gonna make is that there, you know, maybe five to seven acres, or could be a little bit more that's available to be developed or redeveloped. And so um, it's really not, um, you know, I, I, you know, I just want to, want to make sure the trust knows that when you hear 150 acres, it's yeah, not, it it's sounds like a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's, you know, it's not all, not all of it's available for, uh, for housing. <laughs> Much of it probably isn't. Could you also point out the apartment complexes, uh, those community, those neighborhoods to the north? Sure, yeah, here's Mill Valley up here. So this is, um, you know, East Hadley Road is just to the north off the map. So that, you know, this is, you know, Mill Valley Apartments um, in this area. Uh, 
Other questions or comments? Well, it seems like access to it's predominantly in Pomeroy Lane. So that's probably going to be a question too in terms of what's going to be built there because there's there seems to be some great ideas, affordable housing and conservation area, um, you know, and recreation area. But it seems like most of the access to the area that's going to be usable is on Pomeroy Lane. Yes, I think your assessment is right. It, it's um, it's next to impossible to cross to create a new crossing over a, a perennial stream like the Fort River. So any development, any any active development, whether it was affordable housing or I don't know, if you wanted to reuse the clubhouse for a senior center, that was one of the ideas. You know, could we could we have a senior center there? Could we? Somebody brought up, could we have a fire station there? Any of those ideas would have to happen south of the river uh, near where Nate was showing us the parking lot and the the former clubhouse uh, building would be right in there. I will say I, I did mention I think at the the info sessions that we did look at the site for a DPW and also for a fire station and the site was deemed not appropriate for either one of those. It is too far south and west for a fire station and uh, too small, uh, the buildable area is too small for a DPW. The DPW needs 10 to 15 acres of upland buildable land for uh, a new facility. Okay, thanks, so Dave. Further very, questions? Yes, very exciting. Or comments? Okay. So I, I was just gonna, sorry, I was just gonna ask, um, so you said the um, ideas will be built into the master plan. Um, is there, you know, points given for all of the hits on affordable housing and all the comments on affordable housing? So then they become more priority because when I looked on it, um, there were great ideas. Um, there were a lot around affordable housing, and then there were a lot of like, you know, agree or agree or a little. I don't know if there were check marks or whatever. People just hit on the comments that they agreed with. So. Um, are you going to use a system of prioritizing depending on how many people agree with something or you know what yeah, I, that's a very good question and i don't think we've we have not fully drafted even an outline for a master plan um but i i think it's going to be more of a of a a planning process than i don't want to say a popularity contest i mean it limited development there is possible we know that and by limited development, I mean a senior center, affordable housing, something could happen in those upland acres on the frontage on West Pomeroy Lane. I think we staff will be going out to you, to various boards and committees, trying to gather more specific input than is available on Engage Amherst. That's a wonderful broad tool, but we will come to you and other boards and committees, and we'd love to spend time with you. I mean, a meeting, an entire meeting focused on helping you understand the, the assets and resources and limitations of Hickory Ridge um, and hear from you and other, other boards and committees what they would like to see there. What does the planning board think uh, should go there? If we, if we arrive at affordable housing as one of the options, um, what kind of affordable housing should it, you know, there are many, many, kinds of housing that could be built there what what is the what, what's what does the site call for there you know um, what what does the the um, the location call for it's near a village center but there's no sidewalks it's not on a bus line all of those factors we'd love to work with you and hear more from you about um, uh, where where we should land if affordable housing is part of the mix there. So I think uh, winter of 22 is going to be the perfect time to do that. You know, January, February, March of 22. Does that sound? Uh, does that sound like something the trust would want to be a part of? I I think definitely we should be a part of that. I was going to suggest tonight that uh, in preparation we begin writing if only a brief description of what it would mean to put uh, an affordable rental development for older adults on that site. 
Uh, it's obviously been something that I've been thinking about. And I think it's something that not that I expect the town to settle on immediately, but that we kind of get ahead of things a little bit by putting in something that we at least as a group uh, would agree upon. I think we'd also agree upon in general that it should be affordable housing. Honestly, the biggest question in my mind is, should it be for older adults or should we be thinking about um, something for uh, the, I don't know, 26 to 55 population rather than older adults, something more like what we're proposing on Belchertown Road and the East Street School. So I think that's a, something that we should be discussing. But in general, I think we want to advocate for use uh, of the site for affordable housing. And as I said, I wanna suggest that uh, we begin to write up that idea and start to massage it and review a draft at the point at which we next meet next month so we can continue to refine our collective ideas. Well, that sounds great, John. I would just ask if you do arrive at a very specific targeted population that that, that be well researched and you know where 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 does that come from? Where where does that idea come from and and what is the genesis of of being that specific? Say an over 55 affordable um, you know uh, development, something like that, or as you suggest, maybe 26 to 50 or whatever. Um, just where 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 does that come from and and why does the trust believe that that is um, the way the project or, or you, you, you understand? Yeah, that is yeah. something we need to come to. Mm -hmm. uh, that sounds perfect. Yeah, and I'm not sure there's an absolute right answer to that question under any circumstances. Uh, given the overall huge need for affordable housing in town, you can almost justify either or both. Uh, so we need to kind of thrash that out among ourselves and decide what we as a group want to advocate for. So I'm Sounds gonna suggest good. that if people are comfortable with this, that Lucia and I start the process of writing something up that we can share with everybody in advance of our next meeting. And then that will leave us uh, uh, with an opportunity to say, no, we like this, or no, we don't like that. Or really what's missing is any discussion of this or whatever it is you all will have to say about this. Uh, are people comfortable with that? Okay, well, I'll make it a formal vote. Um, I move that uh, we draft an initial proposal for affordable housing at the Hickory Ridge site. Is there a second to that? I'll second it. Okay, so I will uh, do a quick run and see who's in favor. Allegra? Ah, yes. Okay, thanks. Erica? Yes. Uh, let's see. Um, Carol? Yes. Will? Yes. Sid? Yes. And I'm a yes. Okay, so we're, we've gotten started. Are there any uh, things that anybody would particularly like to see in this draft? I know we talked last time about mixed families in terms of affordable housing, and there were some barriers regarding funding, but maybe we could use some ARPA funding. Uh, yep, that, that would be, uh, I guess it would be a possibility. I don't know for sure, but yes, that would be something to look into. Other comments or thoughts? Well, okay, I, I, sorry. I just was going to agree with Erica. That's I can't I'm hear like, you. I, I'd just like to agree with Erica. I'd like it to be, uh, you know, a range of ages and kinds of people 
if it could be somehow. Good point. Any any other uh, comments or thoughts for what we should be addressing? Okay, well, Lucia and I will get to work and hopefully we'll have something for you in two to three weeks. Um, there's something else I put under this, although it didn't show up formally under the, the agenda, but I think it's important enough to mention. Um, Amherst has applied to become a quote unquote dementia friendly community. There's a state initiative on that and various cities and towns around the state are working on becoming dementia friendly communities. In our region, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is working with towns that have volunteered to do this uh, in order to kind of figure out what they need to do to make appropriate changes. One of the things that the commission is asking towns to do is a survey of older adults. I have not seen the content of the survey, um, so I can't really tell you much about it, but I know there's a base survey that exists that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission has. I know that it's also possible for towns to make changes or not changes, but additions to the survey if they have questions they'd like to do. I know all this pretty much from talking to Mary Beth before she left. I was looking forward to our collaborating with her on this, but that's not gonna happen. Um, at this point, Maureen, I believe in the planning department uh, is probably gonna be taking the lead on that. Is that right, Nate? Yeah, I believe so, yep. Okay, so I've communicated a little bit with her and with the Pioneer Valley uh, planning person who is working on this initiative. Um, there are a couple of things I'd like to see. I wanna be sure that there are questions in the survey that relate to the housing needs for older adults. I'd like us to be in a position once the data is collected to be able to estimate the number of adult, older adults who may be seeking affordable housing, uh, estimating those who may be intending to downsize from their current living situation, and estimating those who may need help to remain in their current homes. Those are three of the things I think we want to accomplish, or I would hope the town would want to accomplish with the survey. The other thing I wanted to mention is the sampling. Um, for those of you who have any experience or training with methods, um, I think it's important to know that the plan from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is to do what is called a convenience sample. That is various groups um, in the town would try to identify places where elders meet or where they congregate and try to get as many people as possible who are there to complete the survey. I really don't have a problem with that. Hopefully that's a process that leads to a lot of surveys. However, I would also like to see a part of the sample be a random sample of say 100 older adults who live in the town of Amherst. And that someone, possibly us, uh, or possibly people collaborating with us at the university make an effort to do a, uh, as much of a true random sample as we could do so that we understand the differences between what you get with a random sample versus what you get from a convenience sample with respect to the representativeness of the adult of the results. So that's something I'd like us to pursue. And I said, I've already talked to Maureen and had some email exchange with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and, uh, I think that's something we should pursue. So uh, that's what I had to say about it at this point in time. As we know more, I'll bring back more information, <coughs> but I did want to give all of you an opportunity to say, that's a terrible idea. We shouldn't be involved in it. 
or that's a pretty good idea and I think I could support it. And John, you're saying take, use the survey that would be developed and just using it to do a random sample in addition to the convenience sampling. That's exactly what I intended, Nate. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, could we use, I mean, for the random sample, John, are you envisioning using like uh, town records to, you know, then? Yeah, yep. that's what that's what Mary Beth would have used. She kept a copy of the town records for older adults. She had a file. I assume the file still exists, or if not, it can be updated. And we would sample from that list. Maybe, maybe that would, uh... I'm worried that uh, that I guess maybe the uh, random sample would mitigate against this, but if you just go to the convenient, the places where people congregate, among other things, I'm worried that you won't get very many BIPOC people. I mean, if you have to be careful about where you pick the congregating people, and uh, it just seems like it could be a really, really skewed. And so if if that's what's going to happen, then it seems like some effort needs to go into making sure that some of the places you consider congregating places that you'd be very careful how you pick them. And they're not, you don't just end up with all of the white old people in Amherst because they're not the only old people here. Well, and with COVID, you know, I'm not sure. How yeah. Many person, uh, you know, even now, it's still, you know, the in person thing seems a little strange. Um, I was going to mention that Erica shared a link in the chat to West Springfield to their age and dementia um, report or do document. I wasn't sure exactly. Um, age it's and their document. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, John, sorry, Nate, I just interrupted. That's, fine. You. That's all I wanted to say. It was just that. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I didn't get a sense of what it actually meant. So, I <laughs> looked it up um, and wanted to see if PVPC had something that explained what it means to be a town that is dementia friendly or supportive. And so, this document actually has some good definitions and some good examples. Um, so, I figured I'd share it with everybody else. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So Maybe we can distribute it by email. I appreciate that, Erica. That sounds good. Yep. Other comments or thoughts about this? I mean, John, to your point, um, depending on how the survey is structured and results could be entered into, um, you know, tabulated, I mean, is 100, you know, if we're doing the effort, is 100 not a lot? You know, should we do 200, you know, or 150? I mean, what, you know, what is uh, appropriate? I, honestly, I think it depends on how much stratification you want to do. Um, and using the town data, it's probably not easy to do a lot of stratification. But for example, do you want the survey to equally represent uh, men and women? Do you want the survey to represent people between 55 and 64, 65 and 74, 75 and 84 and 85 and up in equal numbers. Uh, the more that we want to do that kind of stratification, the larger the sample needs to be. On the other hand, it could be too much of a challenge to our resources. Also, in response to what Carol said, if we were to do a random sample of 100 older adults, it honestly would not solve the problem of represented of BIPOC persons in the community. My guess is among older adults, that's probably no more than 15 to 20%. So we'd have a relatively small number of those persons in the sample. And the only way to do better would be to have some strategy for oversampling, either in the convenience sample or the random sample or both. But you make a good point, Carol, and everybody should be thinking about a way to overcome it. Everybody, especially Lucia. <laughs> Other thoughts? Okay, I'm going to close with that. Again, that's something we'll be uh, working on. Uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe we should take a vote to see if everybody supports our working on developing a survey to collect this kind of information 
in concert with the town and uh, with other people in, uh, in the older adult community in town. Uh, so I move that we do this, undertake this. Is there a second? Well, if there's no second, then we're definitely not going to do it. I'm not, I'm, I think I don't understand well enough what our purpose in doing it is to, to, to have an intelligent vote. I, I just don't quite get it. So I'm sorry. Okay, that's perfectly reasonable, Carol. And I sort of think I suggested that earlier and let me go over what I had to say. And people can then ask questions or make their own points. Um, I think we should know the number of older adults to the extent that we can who are seeking affordable housing in Amherst. Okay. Um, and that would include an, es an estimate of the number of older adults who may be intending to downsize from their current living situation and would like a place to go that would be affordable. So those would be questions, those would just be questions because it says it's a dementia thing, which means like, what does that have to do with affordable housing directly? I guess well, I'm just getting tangled up. The questions that you just said, yes, we should know those. And if this survey is a way that we get that, maybe along with some other bunch of stuff that somebody else wants, but as long as the survey gets the answers to the questions that you're asking, then yes, we should do it. Okay. And I'll just mention my third point. Sorry. I'm... That's okay. Estimating the number of older adults who may need help to remain in their current homes. Yeah. Now, some of those people may have or will have dementia. So this isn't irrelevant to dementia, but it, it's a little bit broader brush. I would, I would agree. So those would be three sample goals for why we would want to get involved in this and why I believe it would have value to the, at least the older adults in our community. John, John we also wanna add how many seniors would wanna age in place uh, in their house, you know, whether it's modifications to the structure or receiving services at home. Yeah, I agree. That's kind of what I meant by the number of older adults um, who may need help to remain in their current homes. Okay, yeah. So yeah, what you're suggesting is a slightly specific or right. slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, goal, but I think it's basically the same. Mm -hmm. I'll second your motion. This is definitely information we need, especially for if we're going to, you know, propose this for the Hickory Ridge, specifically for older adults. Okay, well, then I'll ask people to vote. Um, those in favor of the motion, Sid? Yeah. Will? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Okay. Um, Carol? Yes. Erica? Yes. And I'm a yes. So we have six people who are yes, which I think is close to unanimity because Francis is no longer a part of the group. Uh, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned to say, I, I forgot to say before, that um, if you know of people who would be interested in joining the trust, please reach out to them. Um, I don't know exactly when the process for uh, identifying a new member will occur, but I'm hopeful that it occurs within the next month or so. Okay, so we've done that item and then the rest of the items are all updates. Um, and most of them, I think, will come from Nate. I'll just mention we, the town did organizing, uh, did organize a meeting of uh, interested parties, that is, people who are interested in bidding on the RFP for East Street Belcher Town Road. Uh, and Nate organized it along with Rob Mora. I don't know how many people we had there, but uh, certainly all of the main not-for-profit developers in the Valley were represented, Home City Housing, uh, Valley Community Development, and Wayfinders. 
Nate, do you want to add to that? No, I mean, there was, you know, another, there could have been a, a you know, a fourth entity or there was an architect um, that maybe working with one of those developers or, you know, someone else. Um, so the site visit was mandatory. So, you know, um, those entities who attended can respond to the proposal, but, you know, there were, you know, a dozen or more took out proposals. Um, yeah, I think there was interest. There were a lot of questions about keeping the school building, you know, capacity of the site. There is wetlands on both sites. Um, you know, East Street School probably has more, a few neighbors that may, um, you know, have questions about a project. So I think that's something that, you know, we may need to uh, help with in terms of advocacy or outreach. Uh, questions are, you know, we still have a few more weeks of questions. So we haven't received any questions, we, we, you know, except for what was at the site visit. So um, proposals are due uh, a month from now, about November 19th. So we're hoping that we'll, you know, at least be one or two proposals um and yeah there hasn't been anything yet you know um you know like i said at the site visit there's probably about 15 questions but nothing uh seemed too alarming so okay thanks um okay town council as people may know did approve a policy uh a comprehensive uh town housing policy uh not last monday but a week ago monday i believe it was um i'm not going to try to go over it now what i'm going to do is distribute the policy hopefully there's a final version because a few amendments were made during the meeting um to everybody and i'd like us to look at it with respect to a uh what are we now doing that's consistent with the policy or planning to do and B, is there anything else we should pull out of it um, that we see, us, see ourselves doing? Um, I think it's a, it's a good document. It's not a perfect document. There is a broad range of things to select from. Neither we nor anybody else is gonna be able to do all of them. Um, but I, I think of it a little bit like a hunting license. There are a lot of things that are supported in there. And I think, uh, Many, if not all of them, are important, and we should declare ourselves about what it is we want to push. So that will be my request to you for our next meeting. Um, let's see, I also uh, wanted Nate to give us an update on what's happening with the assessment of the property on Strong Street, or really properties. Yeah, that's, that's going a little slow. There's still a few consultants. So I don't know, they, I keep dogging them and they haven't responded very well. Um, some of the neighbors have reached out to the town actually um, because this has been mentioned at a few meetings. And so I know David had said, um, Zomac, that he'd like to get out there again and meet with them because there's, um, you know, a bit of concern um, with the neighbors. You know, from the neighbors, they have questions and we, you know, we just want to make sure um, you know, we can include them in the process. Um, you know, that's about it. I will say that, you know, I, the thought really is to run utilities to the site. And, um, you know, it's probably, it would be a difficult site for, um, for well and septic. Uh, and just, you know, it increases the cost. So Habitat, you know, I've talked with Habitat and a few different um, entities and, you know, they've asked if the town would be willing to pay for the utility costs and, you know, do the site work. Uh, which is what we did at Olympia Oaks um, through block grant and other funding, but it just not that it complicates the process, but it you know it it elongates it a bit because you know we'd have a separate a separate project essentially is bringing utilities and site work, and then the, there's development of the site. So um, yeah, I'm curious just to see. I you know I've asked a few different landscape architects and engineers to provide quotes for services to see what they'd say about the site. But yeah, well, once we know what's necessary. Yeah. Again, that could be a possible use of ARPA funds. It could. Assuming we're talking, still talking about home ownership development on the site. Yeah. Yeah. Um, last but not least, the shelter season uh, begins, I believe, on November 1st. Um, I know for certain that the University Motor Lodge will definitely be in use to by Craig's doors for sheltering. And I don't know exactly where this is, but I'm quite sure that they were negotiating 
with a religious community or a congregate religious faith-based congregation in town to do a congregate shelter. Uh, and uh, I know who they were negotiating with, but I don't feel at liberty to disclose that. Yeah, I think the shelter may not open on the first. It may be um, a little delayed. And I think that um, because there's different facilities, you know, I think that Craig's doors will have to, you know, I think the, the guests at the shelter will be moved around in the morning or evenings to different locations for certain services. So, you know, I think this is, you know, probably an interim year, my thought is in terms, you know, of a sheltering um, approach, right? Because I think that, you know, between meals, showers, all these things, I'm not sure they can all happen at one location. Uh, so, you know, I, I think, you know, um, the discussion about ARPA funds and, and having a permanent shelter or transitional housing, I think is really important given that, you know, Craig's doors doesn't, you know, they, they're, you know, they're very fortunate that someone will uh, lease them space, but it's not really a permanent solution. Okay, so it's all a work in progress at the moment. Um, and maybe we'll have it wrapped up by the time we meet in November. Even if the congregate shelter hasn't opened, we'll know when it's likely to open and exactly what the plan is. Um, I did want to mention that our next meeting of the Housing Trust is on Thursday, November 11th. So please put that in your calendars. Um, the housing John, quickly, that's that's Veterans Day, so we can't uh, meet that day. Oh, really? That's a Thursday. Thursday is Veterans Day. Yep, 11th. Ah. <laughs> well, uh, I guess we'll poll people to see if there's a better day that week that we can move our meeting time to. Uh, I guess we could do it right now. Uh, how many people could not do Wednesday the 10th? That's the I, closest day. I might, I might not be able to. I've been meeting almost every Wednesday with the planning board or someone else for zoning. So, uh, CF earlier zoning? discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody else not able to meet on Wednesday the 10th? I mean, it's not scheduled right now, but it just, you know, it often happens that the planning board had been meeting like almost every Wednesday. Well, maybe they can take that day off and bask in the sunshine on the 11th or something. Okay, so the 10th is a possibility. Um, I, what I would, about the I would 9th? not be able to do the 10th. You can't do the 10th. No, not at all. Okay. Who could not do the 9th? That's Tuesday of that week. So Allegra can't do the ninth. Anybody else cannot do the ninth? Okay, so Allegra can't do the ninth. Sid can't do the 10th. And uh, Nate may not be able to do the 10th. Well, I'll do some further polling after this meeting and see if we can come closer to a solution. We could also postpone a week Oh, uh, maybe move it up a week to the fourth, because I do want to be mindful of the fact that Sean has a deadline when he needs feedback from us uh, about what our priorities are for the ARPA funding. So let me go to the fourth. Who cannot do it on the fourth? Fourth of November, that's a Thursday. Well, that's looking pretty good. Yeah, that just gives us less time to write up our pieces, though. Um, and I'm going to be on vacation next week away. So I. It's perfect thing to do while you're on vacation. A little downtime. Writing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> yeah, that's only that's my only reluctance is that it's sooner. <laughs> well, I think we'll have to bite the bullet because obviously it's a problem to do it on Tuesday, a Wednesday, day a week. the following week. So I think for now, uh, our new date will be Thursday, November 4th. I think, yeah, I mean, I would just, I would assure you that it doesn't have to be a long narrative about uh, each activity. And I think some of it might be just to help Sean present to the council, um, you know, if they ask, you know, I think he wants to keep the housing piece broad just so that they're not voting um, a specific activity, but we could say, well, here are, you know, four or five things that trust is researching just so 
I mean, I think it might just be to that extent, John, unless they start asking questions, but I know his hope is to not, not have, you know, a very specific thing that's voted on at this time, just because it, I think that's a good idea, but nonetheless, I'd like to see something. So let's limit it to a page or two for each activity. So I can John, come up with a paragraph you win. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, John, you give us the structure and we'll fill it in for our pieces. Okay, I'll that think about that. That's a good idea. I like that. Thanks, Erica. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you were tired. <laughs> okay, man. I also wanted to mention two other things. The Housing Coalition is meeting October 26th, which is a Tuesday later this month. I think at that time, the Housing Coalition will talk about uh, the responses to the survey that it submitted to town council candidates regarding their support of affordable housing. If people haven't seen the survey or more importantly, the responses of town council candidates, there is a website you can go to. I can't remember, did I send out the website link to everybody? I think so. Okay, well, if not, somebody tell so. me and I'll fix that problem. Okay, thanks very much. Are there any last minute comments? Okay, I appreciate everybody's time and contributions. I think this has been a good meeting, not too longer than it needed to be uh, since it's only 10 minutes after nine. Okay, thanks. And Nate, if you and I and Lucia could stay on for a few minutes to respond to a question that she asked.